Chapter 8, Vanished. The three girls kept an alert watch, ready to ward off any attack by a lurking enemy. Meanwhile, Ned, Bert, and Dave crashed through the woods. They could hear the fugitive not far ahead, but despite the brilliant moonlight, they could not see him. Suddenly, the man stopped. Was he hiding or lying in wait for the boys? One thing is sure, Ned remarked. That fellow knows this area better than we do. The boys stood still and listened intently. Now there was not a sound. I guess we'll have to give up, Bert replied. A second later, he exclaimed, Listen! Not far below, they could hear a motor start up. There's your answer, Dave said. That guy had a car parked down there and we lost him. Disappointed, the three climbed the hill and reported to the girls. Never mind, said Bess. No telling what he might have done to you. Even in the moonlight, this place seems creepy. I kept imagining eyes looking at me from the windows in the zigzag house. Dave laughed. Let's go in and see who belongs to the eyes. Ned looked into the moat. The fire's out. Probably oil was poured on the water and set ablaze. It didn't last long. Nancy suggested that two of the groups should guard the sapling bridge, while the others went inside to investigate the premises. George and Bert agreed to remain outside. The four other young people stepped into the entrance hall. Ned remarked that he was sure the staircase had been built in this strange design for some special reason. By the way, how old is the house? Nancy said Mrs. Carrier had told her it had been put up about ten years ago. Before that time, Raleigh resided in the old family homestead with his parents. When they passed away, Mrs. Carrier, a widow, went to live there. It was then that Raleigh decided to build his own place. I understand he's a bachelor. Let's examine the staircase very carefully, Ned suggested. He and the others tested every step. Dave declared that each one sounded different from the rest. Listen! He went to the top and stomped on each stair as he descended. Nancy's eyes grew wide. Why, they're the tones of the scale, she exclaimed. Dave grinned. He tried tapping on various treads at intervals. Bess laughed. You're playing three blind mice. Right, Dave answered. Now I'll do Mary had a little lamb. Ned began to click each spindle to see if they too produced various sounds. But they showed no variation. Next, the two railings were tapped all the way to the bottom, but did not indicate any difference in sound. Do you suppose, Bess asked, that maybe we'll come across a sheet of music with a special tune which will reveal the secret of the staircase? Everyone thought it was a good possibility and decided to start a search. Nancy and Ned went into the living room. They looked inside books and table drawers and under various pieces of statuary. Finally, Ned remarked, those musical steps are probably just another freakish idea of Raleigh's. The couple walked into the hall. Nancy pointed to the oriental hand-embroidered picture. It occurred to me, she remarked, that this wall hanging might contain the answer to the mystery. Ned gazed at the embroidered piece in fascination. It's pretty sadistic, he said. A lot of ugly, coiled-up serpents all eating something poisonous. I don't know much about poisons, Nancy admitted. Are you familiar with them? Ned said that in one of his courses he had learned about many of them. This plant, he said, pointing, is the poisonous hemlock. And this one the serpent is chewing is jimson weed, fatal to cattle who eat it. Nancy said, One thing that puzzles me is this object at the bottom of the picture. It looks like an arrow. It is an arrow, Ned agreed. In South America, some tribes make a concoction of poisonous juices into a paste and put it on the tip of an arrow. It's called curare. When the arrow is shot into the body of a person or an animal, the poison is quickly absorbed and causes death in a short time. What's this beautiful snake called? The one the fiery serpent is devouring, Nancy asked. Crate, Ned replied. It's found in Southeast Asia and is extremely poisonous. Nancy pointed to a small snake. That's a water moccasin, isn't it? She asked. I've seen them in Florida. Ned nodded. And this thing you see dangling from the next serpent's mouth, I guess you recognize as a black widow spider. What we have to do now, said Nancy, is figure out the meaning of all of this. Do you suppose, 
Her question was cut short by loud yells of distress from Bess and Dave in the kitchen. Nancy and Ned rushed through the swinging door. To their amazement, the couple was not there. Standing in the middle of the floor was the robot, its usual vacant stare giving no clue to what had happened. How did you get out? Nancy asked the mechanical man. She rushed to the closet in which he had been locked. Though the key was still in the door, the door itself was not locked. Nancy yanked it open. There was nothing inside but the assortment of kitchen necessities which had been there earlier. Where could Bess and Dave have gone? Both she and Ned called their friends' names. There was no answer. They searched the other first floor rooms but saw no sign of the couple. Ned frowned. They couldn't be playing a joke on us, could they? Nancy said she doubted this. I wonder if they took the robot out of that closet and if he could have had anything to do with their disappearance. How could he? Ned asked. Nancy said she did not know but was going to investigate. The first thing we should do is put the robot back in the closet, lock it, and for safety hide the key. Ned pushed the mechanical man inside. After locking the door, Nancy hid the key under a statuette in the living room. Unless there's a seeing eye around here, she remarked. No one will find that key easily. Do you think, Ned asked, the man who ran away from here might have taken the robot out? Nancy nodded. Furthermore, I believe he inserted a tape. When Bess and Dave came into the kitchen, the sound of their voices activated the robot. But what could he have done to them? Nancy and Ned stood still, surveying the entire room. I don't see a thing, Ned said finally. Let's go outdoors. Maybe Bess and Dave ran into the yard. He and Nancy hurried to the front door and called to George and Bert. Have you seen Bess and Dave? Nancy queried. The answers were no. Did they come outside? Bert asked. I don't know, Nancy replied. They've disappeared. What? George exclaimed in alarm. Bert said that he would circle the house and see if he could find the missing couple. In a few minutes he returned, shaking his head. Then they must be inside, Ned declared. Come on, Nancy, we've got to find them. George and Bert wanted to help, but the bridge had to be guarded. The whole group did not want to be marooned on this side of the moat. Nancy was convinced that whatever had happened to their missing friends had taken place in the kitchen. She and Ned went directly there. Presently, Nancy snapped her fingers. See something? Ned asked. Yes, Nancy replied. She pointed to the floor. It was covered with linoleum in a pattern of large black and white squares. Nancy got down on hands and knees, took her flashlight from a pocket, and beamed it on the various blocks. Carefully, she went over the surface. Ned used his light, too. Near the center of the floor, Nancy spotted a section where the tiles definitely were not cemented together. She tried to pull one up. It stuck tightly to the floor. Ned, she said, running the beam of her flashlight around an area about four feet square. I believe there's a trap door underneath here. Bess and Dave went through it. End of chapter 8